Macroeconomics, it's what's happening and it's happening now. If you want big models, and I mean really big models, macro is what you want. We've got your models of inflation. We've got unemployment. We've even included economic growth. Yes, I said growth. We've got your basic models of cycles, and right now, we'll throw in international trade. Learn about economic data. See what's happening in the world. Find out how it all fits together. We've got it all. The whole shooting match. It's macroeconomics. It's bigger than ever. Don't miss it, whatever you do. Economics 201, we covered microeconomics, the study of how individuals and firms make decisions and the effect of those decisions on individual utility, profit, and price. Questions were how do individuals allocate scarce resources to maximize utility? How do firms transform inputs into outputs? What do economists mean by competition? And why does a doctor earn $200,000 a year and a school teacher $20,000? In Economics 202, we are concerned with problems affecting the economy as a whole. What determines the level of output? Why is unemployment 5% instead of 10%? Why is inflation 3% instead of 6%? We begin with the idea that our economy is a mechanism for growth. At the end of World War II, only half the households in the country had automobiles. Virtually no one had a television set, and the interstate highway system had yet to be built. Today, most households own two cars, 97% have television sets, and the interstate system, once seen as the solution to our transportation problem, now seems inadequate. As Americans, we seem to like growth. We like the benefit it brings, and we want it to continue. So as a society, how do we maintain economic growth? How do we ensure that businesses earn sufficient profits to produce the goods and services that people want to buy? How do we provide jobs to ensure that people have the income to buy those goods and services? And how do we keep the prices of those goods and services from rising or falling? These are the questions of macroeconomics. More formally, macroeconomics is the study of the determinants of income, employment, and the price level. All macroeconomic theories are concerned with increasing income, providing employment, and stabilizing prices. They differ, however, in how best to achieve these goals. Macroeconomics is also concerned with understanding the absence of economic growth and the problems that its absence can bring about, such as bankruptcy, unemployment, and poverty. As a discipline separate from micro, macroeconomics stems from the Great Depression of the 1930s. Specifically, its origins are in the efforts of economists, particularly John Maynard Keynes, to understand the causes of the Great Depression and to suggest policies to resolve it. Today, however, we face a very different set of problems from those living in the Depression. How should we deal with a rising government deficit? Should we pass a balanced budget amendment? Or would such an amendment make it more difficult to resolve another depression? Prices are stable, but is there a possibility of inflation? And while we presently enjoy economic prosperity, why have the incomes of most Americans not increased? The structure of our economy is also very different from that which existed during the Great Depression. First, we are becoming increasingly globalized. The shoes we wear are made in Taiwan, the computers we use are from Japan, the cars we drive are assembled in Mexico. What we do affects foreigners, and what they do affects us to a far greater extent than ever before. Second, our jobs have changed. Only 3% of us farm anymore versus 20% in the 1930s. Few of us work in steel mills, coal mines, or automobile plants. Manufacturing has found cheaper labor overseas, forcing more of us to find jobs in the service industries, such as working at McDonald's, selling shoes, or advising clients on the best investments. What does the transition to a service economy mean for sustaining economic growth? Will a service economy generate sufficient income to enable most people to achieve an American dream? Third, the role of the government has changed significantly since the Great Depression. Government is a major force in the economy, spending at all levels one-third of the economy's output. 
the Employment Act of 1946 formally established government's responsibility to maintain economic growth. Institutions now exist to short-circuit an economic collapse. We have deposit insurance, unemployment insurance, welfare programs, and social security. These institutions are designed to prevent another depression, but could another depression occur? Remember the last time we had a war production boom? Remember the silk shirts we bought? Remember after the war when the merry-go-round broke down? We had bread lines. Brother, can you spare a dime? We'll begin by reviewing what's happened to output, employment, and prices over time. This graph shows increases in gross domestic product, or GDP, since 1929. Gross domestic product is defined as the total amount of all goods and services produced by the domestic economy in one year. In 1929, GDP was $100 billion. Today, it's 60 times greater. This, however, is unadjusted for changes in prices. In 1929, a loaf of bread cost five cents. Today, the same loaf costs over a dollar. When we adjust for prices, we find that the growth is not so dramatic. Well, notice that when we look at the growth of GDP over time, we see that it grows by spurts, not nicely and smoothly. We can get a better image of these spurts of growth by looking at the percent change in GDP over time. The percent change in GDP over time is called the business cycle. The business cycle is comprised of four parts, the boom, peak, recession, and trough, referring to the rise, the top, the fall, and the bottom of the cycle. Economists try to predict the business cycle by examining certain indicators. Leading indicators, such as consumer confidence, indicate a future change in the business cycle. Coincident indicators, such as retail sales, occur simultaneously, and lagging indicators, such as unemployment, follow the changes in the business cycle. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Since World War II, the American economy has seen eight recessions, defined as two quarters of negative growth. The graph suggests that since the depression of the 1930s and World War II, the economy has become more stable. Despite efforts, however, policymakers have been unable to eliminate the business cycle. Well, why? Well, first, there's no consensus regarding the proper policy. Should government use fiscal policy, or government's power to tax and spend, monetary policy, government's powers over the money supply, or both? And what type of fiscal policy should the government use? Should government cut taxes, increase spending, or both? And which taxes should the government cut and to whom? Or should the government leave things alone? Second, there's no consensus regarding what are the major economic problems. This is aggravated by the fact that different policies are often contradictory. For example, there appears to be a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. Should government reduce unemployment or should it fight inflation? Should the government support the elderly and the unemployed or should it balance the federal budget? Third, what does the data mean? For example, is gross domestic product an accurate measure of economic progress? Gross domestic product measures the monetary transactions of an economy. So if a company spends two billion dollars to clean off an oil spill, that expenditure shows up as an increase in GDP. If our cities hire more police to handle increases in crime, that shows up as an increase in GDP. And if we hire lawyers to handle increasing litigation, that shows up as an increase in GDP. Does this mean that more oil spills, more crime, and more litigation is good for the economy? Fourth, does the economy work on a simple cause and effect basis, or is the economy more complex? Like weather systems, many variables interact in our economy. This means that changing one variable to affect another may not have the effect predicted by theory. The older argument is actually kind of more interesting to me, at least, in some ways, and that's just that markets really aren't very nice things. Markets cause people to behave toward each other, in ways which are not very human. Uh, these arguments go back a long time. Plato was opposed to markets. Uh, starting in the 1500s with Sir Thomas Moore, uh, there was a number of uh, works. The, the general genre referred to as utopian literature, where people tried to put forward the, what they thought would be a nicer human society. And the vast majority of these eliminated markets because they thought that markets caused people to be more selfish, they thought that markets set people against each other. 
They thought that markets broke down human solidarity, and that would lead to social problems and so forth. So that's the second argument. Uh, it began quite a while back, but it's still quite relevant to what's going on today. Many modern critics of the market system in the United States argue that many of our problems of crime or drugs or violence are connected to this excessive individualism, which the market uh, tends to foster, and the ripping up of the social fabric that, uh, that's connected with it. Markets are necessary because there are extensive and very complex interdependencies among people, and these have to be worked out in some way or another. And in a market society, they're worked out through prices, through excess supply and excess demand as the structure of prices changes. But this is, to my mind, a very inefficient way of doing it, and it very predictably results in recurring economic instability, results in periods of prosperity and even inflation, and then uh, f followed by periods of depression, recession, high unemployment, and general despair, and in fact takes great toll. Uh, when I hear someone say markets are efficient, then I usually refer them to uh, portions of John Steinbeck's great book, The Grapes of Wrath, where uh, people are starving uh, in the migrant labor camps, and they're right next to fruit orchards where the fruit is falling on the ground, and the owners of the fruit orchards are hiring armed guards to shoot anyone who takes the fruit that's rotting on the ground to keep from starving, because if he allows the starving to come and take the fruit off the ground, then those few paying customers that he has will just walk in and take the fruit off the ground. So markets require food to rot in times like that while people starve. To me, that's about as inefficient as an economic system can be. Now let's turn to the price level and see what's happened to it over time. The price level is defined as the average level of prices. A rising price level is called inflation. A falling price level is called deflation, but both can be troublesome. Inflation, particularly if it's unanticipated, hurts creditors, those on fixed incomes and those whose assets or incomes rise less than the inflation rate. Creditors are hurt because debtors repay their debts with dollars that are worth less than those that they originally borrowed. Many people who purchased homes in the 1960s benefited from inflation. Those on fixed incomes are hurt because inflation erodes their purchasing power. Although they receive the same number of dollars as before, which is called nominal income, they can buy fewer goods and services, and that's real income with those dollars. Those whose assets or income increase in value at less than the rate of inflation are hurt for similar reasons. Well, deflation has the opposite effect. Creditors benefit at the expense of debtors. Those on fixed incomes benefit, and those who hold dollars or dollar-denominated assets benefit as well. During this century, inflation has been the primary problem, but during the 19th century and during the Great Depression, deflation was prevalent. The price level actually declined, and along with it, people's wages. Since World War II, though, the price level has increased dramatically. Inflation was moderate throughout the 1950s and mid-1960s. By the late 1960s through the 1970s, inflation accelerated. Some economists believe there exists a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. This trade-off is known as the Phillips curve. The curve implies that to reduce unemployment, policymakers must increase inflation. And on the other hand, to reduce inflation, policymakers must accept higher unemployment. By the late 1970s, this trade-off appeared to be in doubt, for both unemployment and inflation increased, a situation called stagflation. By the 1980s, though, both inflation and unemployment had moderated. Although unemployment remains high relative to the golden years of the 1950s, some economists argue there exists a natural rate of unemployment. If unemployment falls below this natural rate, the result is inflation. Now let's turn to unemployment and see what's happened to it over time. Unemployed are individuals who are looking for a job but can't find one. In other words, the unemployed are involuntarily out of work. The unemployment rate is defined as those unemployed divided by those who have jobs and those who want jobs. 
During the Great Depression, unemployment increased to about 25% of the labor force. By the early 40s, that rate had fallen to around 2%. The unemployment rate typically follows the business cycle, which are cycles of economic growth and contraction. But there's also a long-term trend. The trend line indicates rising unemployment. Also, the unemployment rate itself is a little deceptive. It only indicates the percent of the labor force involuntarily unemployed. and It doesn't indicate the kinds of jobs that people have. Structural changes in the American economy have led to a shift from industrial jobs to service jobs, which typically pay less. Also, unemployment rates don't count discouraged individuals or those individuals who have simply given up looking for work. These graphs are the business cycle, the price level, and the unemployment rate over time raise the following question. Is our economy fundamentally stable or unstable? Those economists who say the economy is inherently stable claim the source of instability is government intervention. Others contend that the economy is basically stable, but make allowances for government intervention to speed up the return to equilibrium. Other economists, however, argue that the economy is inherently unstable and requires government intervention. Maybe there's another way to view the stability or instability of the economy by looking at the major components of GDP, including consumption, investment, government spending, and exports minus imports. Well, Richard, that was very interesting. What else do you got for me? Consumer expenditures are broken down into expenditures for non-durable goods, such as food and clothing, and durable goods, such as automobiles and services. When we look at consumption over time, we see two things. First, it's the largest component, hovering around 67% of GDP. And second, it's very stable. Notice that during the Depression years of the 1930s, consumption as a percentage of GDP was relatively high, indicating that as incomes fell, individuals sought to maintain their former spending levels. During World War II, consumption fell dramatically. There was little to buy, goods were rationed, and individuals were encouraged to buy war bonds. If we are to win this war, every penny that can be spared must go into war saving stamps and bonds. That's why you see the Minuteman wherever you turn. That's why you hear warning voices. Buy defense bonds and stamps today and every day. Buy United States war bonds and stamps. Put every dollar you can into defense bonds sold by any bank, post office, or savings and loan association. Next, let's look at investment, defined as expenditures for capital goods, inventories, and new construction. We find that investment is the most volatile component of GDP. Note that during the height of the Great Depression years of the 1930s, investment spending was almost non-existent. Investment was also slight during World War II, explained largely by the dramatic increase in government spending that crowded out both investment and consumer spending. While investment spending has been strong since World War II, the trend indicates that as a percentage of GDP, investment is declining. And what does this mean? Investment represents business purchases of capital goods, goods used to produce other goods, and inventories. If businesses purchase fewer capital goods, economic growth slows. And this affects everything. Tax revenues don't rise as fast. Employment opportunities decline for an ever-growing population. Productivity increases slow. Rise in people's incomes diminish, and so on. Next, we look at government expenditures, which include government spending on goods and services, and excludes transfer payments such as Social Security and the like. Perhaps surprisingly, government expenditures on goods and services has remained relatively stable since World War II at about 22%. Finally, we look at exports and imports. Exports are goods that other nations buy from us. Imports are goods we buy from other nations. Net exports, which is exports minus imports, is referred to as the trade balance. We can make two observations from the graph. First, until 1982, exports exceeded imports, meaning the United States had a balance of trade surplus. Since then, though, we have run a balance of trade deficit. And second, we find that both exports and imports are becoming significantly larger as a percentage of GDP. This reflects the globalization of the world economy.
What can we conclude from examining the various components of GDP? Well, we see some components such as consumption and government spending are relatively stable. Exports and imports are less stable and rising, but investment spending is highly unstable. So what causes this instability? And does this instability in fact cause the economy to be unstable? We'll try to address these questions in later segments. Now let's look at some various sources of income for GDP. What about the different incomes that accrue to individuals? How have they changed over time? As a percentage, employee compensation is the largest component, comprising about 70% of national income. Farm income over the years has been declining. Non-farm proprietor income, incomes of small businesses owned as proprietorships or partnerships, has been steadily declining. Corporate profits has been following this trend. Rents over the years has also declined. But net interest, that is interest on debt, over the years has been increasing. Both the decline in corporate profits and proprietor profits and the rise in net interest as a percentage of national income warrant some concern. Declining profits may kind of preview declines in investment, which in turn means slower growth, fewer additional jobs, and smaller increases in income. High interest income is also a problem. Increases in interest income during the 1980s resulted from two factors, higher interest rates and more debt. Interest for both consumers and businesses alike is an expense, so it leaves consumers with less money to spend and businesses with less money to invest or to pay employees or stockholders. Oh, yeah. Let's review. First, we began by covering some of the issues of macroeconomics. It's the study of the determinants of output, employment, and the price level. More generally, macroeconomics is concerned with maintaining economic growth. Second, we covered some of the measures of output, employment, and the price level over time. Third, we looked at what's happened to the components of GDP, consumption, investment, government spending, and exports and imports. We found that consumption and government spending are relatively stable. Investment, on the other hand, is more volatile. We also found that both exports and imports are rising, and that since 1982, we have been importing much more than we have exported. We also looked at the various forms of income. Despite the recent recovery, the long-term trend suggests a decline in profits, both of corporations and proprietorships. Wages, on the other hand, have remained relatively stable, while interest income has been rising. While we've covered a number of facts, they really don't speak for themselves. Data often need theory to give them a perspective, to guide policy, and to provide voters a basis upon which to evaluate the policies of decision makers. The goal of macroeconomics is to achieve full employment with no inflation and rising real incomes. The segments that follow consider the various theories, classical, Keynesian, monetarist, rational expectationist, and supply side that economists have developed to achieve these goals. Mm -hmm.